Hello, spookies. Welcome to the Rick or Treat Horror Show. Nope. God damn it. I did it again. That's not the name of my podcast. <laughs> Spookies, welcome back to the Rick or Treat Horror Cast, hosted by yours, Ghoulie, Ricky J. Duarte. Today I'm joined by, frankly, one of my top three, maybe top two, maybe top one favorite podcasts. Please welcome to the pod, Scared Gay. Today we're featuring Paul Jordan and Pablo Escobar, the two hosts of the show. Say hi, boys. Hi. Hello, Paul. What We were both called Tops. I know. That's the <laughs> first time ever. What? And I have a funny story about that later, <laughs> referring to this movie. <laughs> when I was going oh, my top, I can't wait. When I was going through my top phase. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely always a phase, isn't it? It was the one time something in Paul was a phase. <laughs> yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll get to the story later. <laughs> oh my God, but, I can't wait. Ricky, thank you so much for your, for your kind words. We're very excited to be here. Yeah, we're so stoked. We love you. We we just adore you, Ricky. Man, Adorable. I adore you guys too. You, I was listening to your podcast for a very long time before I started my own, and you were maybe a little bit of the deciding factor in getting mine going. I thought if these two goons can do it, so can I. <laughs> exactly. No, yeah. If 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 Paul and I could complete something, anyone can do it. <laughs> Totally kidding, totally kidding. You were a huge inspiration. Uh, and you were kind enough to have me as a guest last month for your Thanksgiving episode. And I'm so happy to have you on mine for another holiday quote classic. Uh, Michael Doherty's Krampus is the film that we will be discussing today. Can I say how many people wrote to me and said that you were an amazing guest on our podcast? People fucking loved having you on the show. You and can tell me you. how many people did that. Go yeah. ahead and tell me how many people did that. <laughs> yeah, well, Chris was one of them. He was like, he's a fabulous guest. Like, he's an amazing guest. And then a few of my friends who listened to it from Bologna and stuff were telling me that you and... are a really good guest on the, on the show. You were great. You were loved. I don't agree, but you know, I'm just kidding. You're <laughs> wonderful. Even our last guest, he uh, w- really commented on you as a guest, particularly. That's why yeah. I sent you his contact info. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. I do intend to reach out because he was a fabulous guest on your episode yeah, about Ready or Not. I love that <laughs> movie, by the way. You guys crushed that episode. Thank you. Thank you. It is a fun film. Well, thank you. It really, really is. Uh, well, all right. So I love to ask my first time guests on the show, what is your horror root? What is the movie that started it all for you? Maybe when you were a kid, you saw something that stuck with you. Paul, you're uh, on the left side of my screen. So let's start with you. <laughs> for me, the movie. So actually, I remember really loving Are You Afraid of the Dark first. So like that's kind of like initially how I got into like liking scary things. But my whole family always has. But the movie that really started it for me was the original Halloween. Same answer. Totally. It's it's my, yeah, yeah, it's my root. (laughs) Definitely. How old were you the first time you saw it? Halloween. I was probably, I don't know, seven, eight. Oh, wow. That is. I was young. I was really young. I had very little supervision growing up. But this was encouraged by my family. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Pablo, what about you? Um, yeah, very similar. I grew up with a family that is um, very obsessed with horror. Horror is a big part of our family and anything and everything scary. My grandma, for as long as I can remember, would constantly tell us terrifying fucking stories about like, like you know, folk tales from Guatemala and like stuff that she saw and all that stuff. For as long as I can remember. And then I had older cousins that were assholes and they would like hold me down and hold my eyeballs open and make me watch like Hellraiser at like 
two or three years old. So I would watch, I was just exposed to horror. It was constantly around and I loved horror. Even as a kid, I never really wanted to watch anything that didn't have horror elements, even though like I was also being like tortured into watching much more extreme stuff. Like my cousins like held me down at like four and made me watch Faces of Death. (laughs) Oh my god <laughs> that's really young i'm 36 and i haven't seen faces of death. Yeah. <laughs> they would like make me do that shit so i'd be like ah and um like some stuff was kind of extreme but i mean as, as as far as i remember like my whole life my whole family everything was just constantly like monsters and ghosts and the devil and demons and all these things and killers and witches and i loved it like we just loved it so there isn't like one thing that i could say was what like sold me into like horror i was just kind of it was i it wasn't a womb it was a tomb you know like it was just already part of that amniotic sac <laughs> and the fluid it just horror oh, is part of my dna from womb to tomb yeah <laughs> the womb was my horror tomb you know <laughs> actually i did leave out one thing my s- sisters did the same thing they used to like make me watch like scary movies like friday the 13th i had seen all of these like they're Halloween was not my first movie horror movie I ever saw, but that's the one that really got me into horror. Nice. I love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. The first one I ever saw, I remember seeing King Kong, uh, the original black and white when I was a wee babe and I was so afraid of it. I was afraid at Chuck E. Cheese uh, because of the gorilla that played the keyboard and the (gasps) rock of fire band, you know, Uh, the animatronic. I associate him with King Kong, even though he was purple and wearing a sequin coat. I was also really afraid. I saw Child's Play at too young of an age, and I had a My Buddy doll. Do you remember My Buddy dolls? Yep. They're the dolls that Chucky was literally based on, but they had brown hair. And I I was so afraid of him after I saw Child's Play that I took him and put him in the trash. Wow. And my mom took him out of the trash and put him on my bed. (laughs) No, this was this actually happened on I think it was season one of the Chucky series, oh. right? So I was watching that happen and I was like, oh my god, this is my life story. That is so funny you say that because I'm 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 38 and I I w- actually wasn't interested in the My Buddy doll until Child's Play that really? I saw. Then I was like, oh, I want one now. Like I, I need, need one. one now. And like, can you believe it? And I think about it now. My parents bought me a devil mask to decorate my room when i was like six years old that's adorable yeah it was cool it was like very like watermelon traditional but it was still the fucking devil and it was awesome all my friends were terrified to enter my room because of it my childhood bedroom was like snoopy and teenage mutant ninja turtles and california raisins i love the california raisins i know (laughs) i know they need we need like a reboot movie of California Raisins. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I wasn't allowed. My room was like decorated very like just traditional, like a lot of like hardware. I wasn't allowed to put up posters. Really? <laughs> everything. Really? Yeah. My mom decor my I refer to my mom's taste as the Julia Sugar Baker collection. I love it. Like I'm obsessed with it. And yeah. She's Southern. She's Southern. So it was very all like but it did not really look like a kid's room. Weirdly, when I envision your mother, I've always envisioned her as Julia Sugarbaker, the way you talk about her. I think my mom envisions herself as Julia Sugarbaker. Oh, I love it. I love That's it. hilarious. God, I only just started watching this, uh, Designing Women, maybe oh, during the so pandemic. Bad. Like, I'd heard of it, but I didn't have access to it, you know? Yeah. It's good. It's so good. Oh, my God. But I got to say, when I moved to Charleston... Uh, well, I discovered it after I lived in Charleston, but like, that was what I envisioned living in the South to be like, like that, or like steel magnolias. I didn't expect like, you know, what I got, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my, my family growing up, because I would live in the South in the summers, and it can confirm. <laughs> can I confirm. It. I love it. Three out of five stars. Might recommend. Nice place to visit. <laughs> Ricky doesn't want to live there again. <laughs> Done it twice. <laughs> uh, well, let me ask you, boys. Have you seen anything good and spooky recently? Any good horror you can recommend? Without no spoilers for this part of the show. Um, I mean, the closest thing that I watched recently that I really enjoyed that I felt is like horror adjacent is The Menu. Oh, tell me about it. I'm curious. It's good. It's It's, it's definitely like comedy, but it's... And, and like thriller it's square and like comedy thriller um clever smart film 
I really enjoyed it. I actually just, I, you know, Chris and I were like 10 out of 10. We really enjoyed it. I love me some Anya Taylor Joy. She's great in everything. Great. I love her. She's I love great. And I was I like, I just found out instead of doing The Witch, she was also offered a Disney Channel TV series and she chose The Witch instead. <laughs> right. And like, I'm someone who's very much like, I love to see Latino and like Anya Taylor Joy is Argentinian. You had yeah. like um, Arturo Castro, who was in Broad City. He's Guatemalan. So obviously I was like, yes. And then you have I like, I know he's on the sh- He's in the menu. He's in the menu. And John Leguizamo, cool. you had like another Latina actress. I was like, there's a lot of like Latinos in this. Like, this is wonderful. Like, it's a great, it's a great film. It's, it's a great film. I, I recommend it. Yeah. I'm excited. The last horror thing I saw was actually Smile. I watched it way too late in comparison, but, and I, yeah, enjoyed it. Uh, more than I thought I was going to. I wouldn't say it's my favorite movie, uh, but it definitely, it was better than I was expecting. It wasn't as boilerplate as like kind of stereotypical what you would expect of, of that film. It made so much fucking money. I made so much money. Well, really cute. I will say thank you, Paul. Like Smile has like a nice little place in my heart because it like, it like Paul saw it and Chris and I were like literally like, putting our like grapes down because we were about to like press like rent and paul was like have you seen smile yet and i was like we're just about to do it and it like he was like you have to watch it so we watched it and it kind of like i mean like we i we do have a great friendship but it was like it took us back to like the root of our friendship just like (laughs) talking about a horror film just like me and you shooting the shit i got like emotional i was like i love paul so much (laughs) oh Oh, that's gonna you're gonna make me cry. No, I was perfect. Like, and then because there's certain reasons, certain themes about it that I, you know, I just know Pablo w- well enough to know that uh, certain things will, <laughs> will will catch his eye. That I was like, hold on, I'm gonna email you. Don't open the email. I'm gonna email you what I think you're gonna say. And I think I got three out of five. That was big top <laughs> energy. Hard. I'm gonna email you your opinions. <laughs> It was good. He did really well. And I was like, first of all, I'm not that transparent bitch. I'm a mystery, okay? You can't no, read me. No, Fucking blocked me so hard. <laughs> I'm an enigma wrapped up in a question mark. <laughs> exactly. No, he oh, I love it. that. It was I, good. I, 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 but if you're going to see it, if you have not seen it, I do recommend watch the short that the, that it's based off of first. It's on YouTube. It's only like 10 minutes long. Mm-hmm. And I think that it adds to the uh, – uh, you kind of pick up some more uh, – it's just something a, a little. I extra. didn't know it was based on a short. So like, um, lights out. It's kind of like that where it started as exactly. okay, the short of lights out. The short lights out was real, real scary, and the movie was not. Have you seen the short that Baba Duke is based off of? No, I didn't know it was. Yeah, it's really good. It's like in black and white. It's really good. Oh, I gotta check it. I love yeah, a movie. lot of these films are based off of very strong shorts. And Paul's right. He was like, you have to watch this first before. And so I did. And I was like, oh, it really, they tie together really well. It really like, it's good. Not a lot of like nice Easter eggs. Mm-hmm. Uh, cool. I haven't watched Smile. Paul, kind of like you, I, I didn't expect much from it. And then it became this big hit. See, I Same. I was really snotty about it because so many good horror movies came out this summer and all these really great movies that, maybe didn't get the acclaim that they deserved. And then Smile came out and it was, it just felt like kind of the accessible basic horror movie that everyone who I know doesn't like, like doesn't care about horror went to see. Yeah. And when something like that happens, I get really snooty and stuck up and bitchy about it. And then I refuse (laughs) to go see it. And then I can't be a part of the conversation because I missed the boat, you know? (laughs) Same, same. And I'll say the trailer really dumbed it down didn't do it many favors, but also kind of gave like, you know what to expect, you know, like it's, it's, we, it, I think this is a film that lets us know that we are done with like thesis horror films. <laughs> We're done with these like, you know, dissertations and studies on horror films. Like we are now squared into let's just fucking, this would have been straight to VHS half on. You know. How do we feel about, how does would have been, how do we feel about Megan? I want to watch it because gay icon dance right there. So good. It's so dumb. <laughs> I love that. Did, did, Stupid. did you see that someone like, like 
took that scene of like her doing the dance and did it to like Britney Spears toxic. It was so good. <laughs> so they also did it to uh, a couple of like Lizzo songs. And I think to WAP too. I saw it, it went viral. Oh, so good. <laughs> yeah. It was like a whole TikTok thing. People were doing the Megan dance. Yeah. I think it looks terrible. I think it looks so bad. But we have but to support I'm... our gay icons, even if they're it's... just like, <laughs> You know? I have a I have a movie pass unlimited unlimited movies for twenty three fifty a month Regal Theaters please sponsor me Ooh. so I'll probably I will go see it because mm-hmm. I also write reviews for a website spoilerreviews dot com but um Ooh. I'm not excited about it at all <laughs> yeah but we'll see real dumb. yeah I you know this week I I've seen two like bloody Christmas movies this month I saw Violent Night when it came out was it last week I think mm-hmm. I heard yeah. it's fine. I had a blast. It's not a masterpiece, but it's not supposed to be. It got kind of like mixed, mostly bad reviews, but I don't, people are compare it, trying to compare it to Die Hard, and I don't understand why. Die Hard is not even a Christmas movie. It's a movie on Christmas. This is a yeah. Christmas movie. Oh, that is <laughs> no a hot what. take. That is a hot take. You know what? Take. I said it. It's Ooh. my podcast. Yeah, no, no. That's <laughs> heterophobic. Heterophobic. <laughs> Oh, I forgot one thing that I just watched recently that I'm fucking obsessed with. What is it? I literally watched it the other day, and it's so bad. It's so dumb. Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2. Oh, one of the oh, worst movies this... ever made. But Is yeah. that the one that's basically a remake of the first one? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's like identical to the first. It's identical to the first one, but then the scenes, like, just, and the death. It's just, the last 25 minutes or so is a fucking shit show and the there best are like possible. five of those movies <laughs> oh, okay but the the lead guy in this one daddy like okay. super hot super i thought the hot. lead guy in silent night deadly night the like the first one i thought he was really cute i was like oh give me he that was. little spinner twink like i'm into it <laughs> spinner twink <laughs> stop <laughs> it <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> spit and spin <laughs> exactly I think I'm only in the mood for bloody gross Christmas. I am not in the mood for Christmas this year. Call me Scrooge. Call me Bah Humbug. I don't care. I haven't even put up a Christmas tree, and I don't think I'm going to. Um, I'm just, I'm working nonstop. I have have (laughs) have two jobs right now, and so I'm waiting on bitchy, mean holiday shoppers or, like, bitchy, mean. It's just people are mean. People are mean at Christmas. They come to New York. And they walk around and they don't know where they are and they get lost. And then I get mad because they're standing in the middle of the, of the sidewalk and they're not moving. And I, ugh. Uh, so same, anyway. same here in San Francisco. But that's perfect because that is so, that ties in so well to this film. To Krampus. exactly with the movie we're going to watch. <laughs> I also want to mention real quick, I saw the mean one, which is the, oh, the, the, Grinch. the horror version of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So it's <gasps> uh, X, X, XYZ Pictures, the same company that's doing... Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey that's yeah. coming out next year, right? Yeah. So that movie uh, became public do- or that uh, that became property yeah. became public domain. So they made a horror movie out of it. Ooh. So they have done. They're Ooh. using parody laws to get away with making a How the Grinch Stole Christmas slasher movie. David the- uh, Howard Thornton, who plays Art the Clown and Terrifier, plays the mean one. They can't say the Grinch in it. The mean- and he's superb. The rest of the movie is total garbage. I cannot. Re- I can't. Rec- I love. A, I love a bad horror movie. This one's worse than Thanks Killing. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> at least Thanks- that's saying Ooh. something. At least Thanks might- Kill. I'm. You're making me want to see it. <laughs> I know. I knew you would say that, Paul. At least Thanks Killing makes you laugh throughout it. This movie doesn't make you laugh. David. Uh, David Howard Thornton as the mean one is only in it for like ten minutes. Like, totally underutilized. Some of the worst filmmaking I've ever seen. So it's like all of the actors are in the movie that you wish you were seeing, but the writers and directors gave us something that nobody wants. Mm. Don't see it in a theater. Wait until it's streaming somewhere and get really stoned or drunk and throw a party and just have it on in the background. And that's what I have to say about the mean one. Okay. That being said, why don't we talk about Krampus? Let's go Rick or treating. Let's go Rick or treating. Get that cramp pussy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How oh. long have you been waiting to say that, Paul? 
He, all week. <laughs> He's been saying it all the time. Uh, don't lie. Trying to get that. Yes. Oh, there, well, there's also a scene where, like, like only try, she tries to get that grand pussy <laughs> at one point too. But never mind. I In the movie, I don't remember that. I mean, I you watch the same that, Krampus. My interpretation. It's my interpretation. Yeah, it's we'll it's wishful thinking on Paul's end. Got it. Well, uh, there are a million Krampus movies, right? Yes. So many of them. It was. It just kind of became a thing in like the late twenty teens or mid to late twenty teens of did. multiple versions of Krampus. I guess we should mention a little bit about what Krampus is. Krampus, in traditional Austro-Bavarian folklore, is kind of the dark version of Santa Claus. Krampus Nacht is December fifth, and on that night, bad children, naughty children, are visited by this goat-like demon creature who's. Uh, carries a sack on his back and he snatches up children and puts them in his sack and takes them to hell and whips them if you're not good. Which, to me, sounds like a fun Saturday night. I don't know. I know, you're like an a, an older man with a big sack? Uh, sure. <laughs> and a you're long, like... long licky tongue? Oh. I'll take it. And yeah. horns. Is it weird that I have a thing for horns? Like, Daniel Radcliffe no. in that movie Horns looked real good. No, it's a I mean... Weird. It's, I, it's like, a little weird. It's a little weird. It's obvious. You're, you're horny. It's pretty obvious. Ah. But I'm hung. Ooh, I'm here all night. Ha, cha, 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 cha. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having Scared Gay Podcast. <laughs> Stupid puns galore. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so this uh, this creature of of uh, Austro Bavarian folklore kind of hit the rounds on the internet and was becoming memes and these little e card like Christmas cards. And Michael Doherty, writer and director of one of my favorite horror movies, mm-hmm. Trick or Treat, Love which it. I did an episode for back in October. Good episode. Saw this Thank you very much. Saw this happening on the internet and fell in love instantly and thought, I want to make a horror Christmas movie. He wanted to make a really dark, gritty, bloody, scary horror Christmas movie, hearkening back to like family horror Christmas or family horror movies like um, Gremlins Mm -hmm. or Poltergeist, Mm -hmm. maybe even The Birds, kind of a Joe Dante feel. Yeah. But he wanted it to be actually hardcore and scary. And uh, Universal Pictures did not believe in the idea of such a graphic horror like based bloody scary Christmas movie. And they made him change it to something a little more approachable. So rather than being a hard R, it is a PG-13. There's nothing wrong with a PG-13 horror movie. Oh, well, and there's nothing wrong with G-rated movies as long as there's lots of sex and violence. Uh, I don't like uh, it. I, this is one of the only PG-13 horror films where I'm like... Same. It, it it works. Most of them, I'm like, no, they're for little kids. I'm done. You're like, don't tell me it's PG-13 because then I won't want to watch it. Yeah. I hate saying but that. But even this one, I do. I think most of it works, right? I like yeah. this movie. I borderline love this movie. Same. I would love to have seen the Michael Doherty gritty Hard grindhouse point. style. Oh, yeah. Horrifying Christmas demon movie, <laughs> you know? I want to know um, the Surgeon Spasoyevic version of Krampus. Paul, you remember who that? That's the guy who made a Serbian film. The Serbian film? <laughs> I want to see his <laughs> Krampus version. Oh, God. I still have not seen a Serbian film. I don't know if it's on my list or not. I haven't even listened to your episode on it because I don't want spoilers in case I do watch it. I don't even know where to find it. You need to. I think it's a film you need to actually know spoilers because you need to know what you're going to get yourself into. I know what I'm getting into. I've heard I've heard it. Okay. Well, we also, when we did our episode, there were certain scenes that we it's not that we glossed over them. We definitely referenced them, but we did not get into details. And I think that's like that's I. our only episode where we get vagueness even but we even paul and i have ethics like at some point (laughs) we have some standards (laughs) we found them thank you serbian film (laughs) but i you're right i i would have loved to seen like a hardcore horror version of this but it doesn't take away that i found this film to be very fun and great and works really well and it's still pretty effective it's true. And if you look at it in that kind of lens of Gremlins as a as yeah. a fun comedy Christmas horror movie, then it totally works. Yeah. Whereas 
I think one of the differences, like I actually consider Gremlins to be something that is a little more like gateway horror. Like it's a great way to introduce maybe children to horror totally. because it's not yes. too intense or Ghostbusters even. I do find this one to be a little more un- like not as approachable for children to watch horror because I think there's a lot of elements where I'm like, that's fucking terrifying. We're not seeing violence and gore. But we are really put in a position where it's like really scary. So like it's it's and and in that sense, like I think that it hits a little bit more like poltergeist, but it's so fun. It's such a great film. It's it's really good. He does a really good job with holidays. <laughs> That's true. Trick or treat, Krampus. He uh, he has he so he announced that, you know, Krampus would be PG thirteen, and then he announced that the Trick or Treat sequel would be back to a hard R, bloody, scary movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're only just now getting Trick or Treat to finally officially moving forward, which I'm so happy for. Me too. I was just about to ask if there are any updates <laughs> on Trick or Treat too. Last update was in October because Trick or Treat finally got its first theatrical release, uh, and so he announced in like kind of side by side with that that it's finally moving forward yes uh, i so don't know if, i don't know if that means officially greenlit but he's at least working hardcore on a screenplay awesome and getting it moving uh so this movie krampus was made on a budget of 15 million dollars and it brought in 61.5 so it was kind of a modest success it was a little bit of it came out and then it did fine and then like over the next two weeks it did pretty well and then everyone kind of forgot about it again yeah I remember not super liking this the first time I saw it, but I think I I definitely actually liked it way more on a rewatch. Hmm. But I hadn't seen it for six years, like yeah. So yeah, I think this was maybe my third time watching it. I went to the movie theater to see it, and the audience reaction was great. People were laughing when they were supposed to. People were laughing when they weren't supposed to <laughs> it was just a fun like audience movie you know yeah i i'm i went with a group of friends about half of us re- really enjoyed the film and the other half thought it was just stupid like they were like Ugh, it's dumb i don't get it like it's dumb which i am like y- you you're all negative and you don't like like fun you know that's it's okay some people aren't into like having fun like that's they like sound a total like really thing. toxic people. I yeah, I don't talk to them anymore. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I have a pretty interesting story or memory that I associate with this. Tell the tale. <laughs> Let's spill it, girl. So this is back when I was in my top phase. Uh so right around right around when this came out on streaming, or I think you could rent it. I yeah, so you were able to rent it at this point. And my <laughs> bottom that I was hooking up with, a, like, I went over to his house uh, to go watch it. And then I end up, like, we order food, like, before it gets there. And I, I'm i like, I'll go out and get it. I'm in flip-flops. I'm uh, wearing basketball shorts, like, commando. And I'm not confident that I was wearing a shirt. This is relevant. Uh, because between his, like, front door, there's, like, a one, there's one gate. And then you walk down this hallway this is in downtown san francisco and then you walk down this hallway and then that's where the front gate is but there's other like rooms that are kind of off the side well (laughs) i went out and i didn't bring a key or my phone um and the first gate shut and locked behind me and so what i had to do (laughs) if anyone had been walking down the street and looked over they would have thought someone on bath salts (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because I had to climb up on top of the trash cans that were right next to the gate and climb that over. One of my flip flops fell off when I was fly- when I like went over and I kind of like very ungraceful, like not graceful at all, parkoured over this gate, opened the opened the latch so that I could grab the food, and then went back inside. And he's like, "Oh, what took you so long?" I was like, "Oh, I- sorry, I got tied up talking to the guy." Never told. <laughs> never told him what had happened all oh, that like and i don't believe in like a higher power i'm pretty atheist <laughs> i don't really believe in like energies and, and i don't believe in any of that but that is proof to me that the universe is telling you <laughs> be truly who you are this is not who you are <laughs> it's true this is a tale warning us of the dangers of being a top <laughs> yeah exactly basketball shorts paul really <laughs> 
Well, because I wanted to put the full or gy- they were like gym shorts or something what? like that. The point what? is, the point is, there was total like there was no underwear. Yeah, if they were they weren't mine. They were his, and like it was like. <laughs> Again, total bro. Flip flops and basketball shorts climbing over a fence God, is what bro. I associate with this movie. I went back in and didn't really like, like, we kind of watched it. So whenever I think of Krampus, though, I think you of, remember that. <laughs> I think of my bottom. I wonder where he is today. <laughs> well, we brought him to the show today. Everyone, <laughs> welcome Paul's bottom. <laughs> He's like, I'm a top Just now. Kidding. Y'all, I actually think in my old age, I think I'm identifying more as a side these days. I just feel oh, like topping God. and bottoming is so much work. So much <laughs> no work. No one likes an old bottom. So no one likes an old bottom. <laughs> much work. And an so old top work. is just a lot of, like, wet noodles, you know? Wet noodles and chew on my titties, boy. Exactly. Very spongy. Spongy. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay. I, oh, are we allowed to be this vulgar on your podcast? Krampus might be a PG-13 horror movie, but the Rick or Treat horror <laughs> cast is not uh, rated. Not rated. An X. <laughs> not submitted to the MPAA. <laughs> not accepted by the MPAA. Not accepted. Absolutely blatantly refused. So back to Krampus. Uh, the film has a pretty cool cast. Uh, at least three of the stars are, are pretty notable. Adam Scott, who we love from Parks and Rec. Love, love, love. Tony Collette, who we love from life. I would watch her take a shit on screen and give her a standing ovation. <laughs> Yay, icon. If Frances McDormand can win an Oscar for taking a shit in a bucket in a van, why can't Tony Collette win an Oscar for literally anything? I don't understand. She Have they not something. seen Muriel's Wedding? <laughs> Muriel's Wedding. Hereditary. Yes. She was nominated yes. She was nominated for The Sixth Sense. Uh, she's only in it for like yeah. 10 minutes, but that scene in the car where so she breaks good. out crying is so fucking good. In a so-so movie. <laughs> Looking back at The Sixth Sense, it's not that great. No, no. Speaking of taking your shit in a bucket and stuff, um, oh, look up... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's not that. It's not taking a shit in a bucket. It's a Manhattan uh... transfer, which is way worse. I don't, every time every time we record a podcast together you teach me some new sex phrase what is this one pablo um well so i'm obsessed with it now i that's all i want to talk about chris is like leave me alone it's a crowdsourced <laughs> hardcore hard hard extreme <laughs> film uh manhattan transfer is when you <laughs> in someone else's <laughs> and then they <laughs> out your <laughs> with their <laughs> and then like people <laughs> and stuff like that I hate you so much. God, we talked about two girls, one cup on my last episode. Crazy, and- crazy. <laughs> one of the Love. girls, one Love. of the girls from Two Girls, One Cup, is in this film, and you know who else? It's way. It's apparently way more extreme than Two Girls, One Cup. I've seen bits and pieces of it, and it's wild. Pablo, every time you bring up things like this, and you, then you pretend like it's not something that you're into, it makes I'm me not. wonder how the fuck. This is the second time we talked about. When I was on your we, show, well, yeah, what oh, did we say? You bring the you were talking about um, oh, fuck, what was it called? Human caviar. Ah! <laughs> this is what it is. <laughs> Chris hates me right now that he's listening to this. He's so I, mad at me. My, to he my listeners, saying. Chris is Pablo's recent husband. Congratulations on your nuptials. Your Thank wedding you. was the gayest thing I've ever seen. Pictures of in my life. Thank you. They were married by a drag queen, the very famous Peaches Christ. Yes. With- um. This. Wedding was the gayest fucking thing I've ever been to in my life. Like, like being in the audience, like it was literally a performance, like a full runway. Listeners, dear listeners, a runway in a club, a prece- followed by multiple performances by a gay male burlesque or a queer uh, burlesque troupe <laughs> and drag queens. <laughs> And drag queens. <laughs> it was so good. So fun. All right. Sorry. I I, I distracted with Ricky's favorite spat talk. Wait, really fast. Speaking of weird porn, um, you can edit this part out. But there's no. this one porn in college. My In college, my the theater department, there was like the like elected council. And I I was on that. And the we would watch weird porn mm-hmm. in, our, in the office that we had. Just like they, basically this glorified closet. And... We watched a bunch of really gross ones, but this just brought me back to uh, this one where this guy, this this girl, she's like, 
do in the pile driver position and all these guys take turns putting their <laughs> in her <laughs> <laughs> and and he's like they the comment the like commentary is great i actually think you can google like just the transcript where it's like asshole, <laughs> like love it keeping my no, I keep my and then like he pulls one guy pulls them out i swear to god it is like a and and then he's like <laughs> uh it's just and says booyah oh and another part he has a <laughs> wow good good for them <laughs> i'm so glad i had you all on the show today <laughs> so glad we're on your show we're defiling the Rick or Treat horror cast. And I thought I was bad. Uh, so back to Krampus. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> sorry, so sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. It's 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 fine. It's great. It's a, this is a content I love. It's why he started <laughs> podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> the film had three writers: Todd Casey, Michael Doherty, and Zach Shields. I don't know anything about the other two besides Michael Doherty. And here's my problem with the movie: mm -hmm. cinematography. I hate the cinematography in this movie it's nothing but tight tight close-ups and shaky camera and like flashing lights shown shown like flash directly into the camera I, it, it's by uh jules o'laughlin i looked up what else they've done and it makes sense it's kind of like b-movie action films uh and miss marvel are the, are the notable credits uh I, I, to me that's what makes this movie not as good as it could be is my inability to see what the hell is happening most of the time right mm -hmm. Go ahead. it is a really dark it is like like visually a real like really dark you can tell what they did with like the first half trying to be almost like a family hallmark kind of uh christmas movie and it's very bright obviously the power goes out and everything but it's really this like like it's very bright normal colors and then the second half once krampus comes into town super like blue scale reminds me of 13 kind of how 13 uh progressively gets more and more dark but this mm -hmm. one is like it's like for lack of a better word like night and day uh between when it's that hallmark kind of and then once once krampus ends up coming to town it's total like blue scale gray like i found i found it also to be i didn't like the cinematography but i also did not like like how dark it was kind of if yeah it gets sense. to a, it gets to a point where it, it's just you, you can't really tell for sure like you can't see well what's going on and i would rather have more i don't know engaging shots instead of me trying to squint because there's flashlights being flashed directly into the camera uh but you're right the first 25 literally 25 or 30 minutes of the movie is not scary it's a family no. dysfunctional family who's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and that's by design michael wanted a, a very hard shift from this kind of you know traditional christmas movie feel to then turning into a horror movie rapidly and it does uh i would love to jump into the plot so the way we're doing this is we're going to read a little bit of a plot synopsis and then we're going to go back and talk about it okay Three days before Christmas, the prosperous but dysfunctional Ingle family prepare for the holidays. The youngest member of the family, Max Ingle, remains a firm believer in Santa Claus and intends to send him a letter. His family includes his teenage sister, Beth, their parents, Tom and Sarah, and Tom's mother, whom the family calls Omi and who speaks mostly German. Sarah's side of the family visiting for Christmas include her sister, Linda, Linda's husband, Howard, Sarah and Linda's cantankerous aunt, Dorothy, and Linda and Howard's children, Howie, Howie Jr., Stevie, Jordan, and baby Chrissy, as well as their bulldog, Rosie. That is the last time that I will be saying these characters' names because there are too many fucking family members and characters in this movie to keep track of. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the plot synopsis also skips over the opening credits, which are one of the best parts of the movie. It takes place in a department store. And you get that Black Friday opening like feel where people are... Um, mad mad rush for merchandise and it is shot in slow motion and it's really effective slow motion the the camera is kind of moving on what must be tracks uh which gives it this immersive feel this is a example of good cinematography in mm -hmm. Krampus, as opposed to literally the rest of the movie uh have you ever worked 
retail during the holidays? Um, no, but I worked at Starbucks in a mall uh, in high school and college. That sounds rough. And so, yeah, I, I have some idea, but like the people who worked in the stores, especially like Macy's and all that stuff, like they had it rough in the holidays. I can only imagine. Yeah. I have to go to the Macy's, the, the big New York Macy's this week to buy a tie for a Christmas present. And Jesus Christ, is it going to be scary? <laughs> oh my God. I am so sorry. It's like, I, lo- I do love going to that Macy's. It is an experience, but man, at Christmas time, you got to have football padding and like a sword to get through. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, I worked, one of my first jobs was at Target uh, when I was in high school. And I remember Black Friday, the doors opening and people just running. Like you see on these videos of people getting trampled. It's ridiculous how just how people treat this day you know yeah it's disgusting totally disgusting anyway it's a really effective scene and it ends with max the young son getting into a fight at a perf- like performing basically and his parents running and pulling him off of somebody uh his parents are adam scott and tony collette uh we then move into the family's house they are very well off they got this gorgeous gorgeous Massive house, like think the Home Alone house, right? Yeah, it's very similar to that, right? Uh, and Tony Collette is maybe a little type A. She's decorated the house in the most perfect Christmas decorations you can possibly imagine. It's like Martha Stewart threw up in her house. Yeah, that's the Loved only her. line that I like liked Aunt Dorothy the character. I, like, I, well, I was also a little obsessed with her, but we'll, I'm sure. We'll I loved her work. character. She's such a bitch. <laughs> Just, yeah. Max, the little boy, has a sister named Beth, who we, she has no personality whatsoever. She's in the movie for 10 minutes. Um, and then Tony Collette's sister and her husband show up. And her sister and her husband are... MAGA. MAGA as fuck. And they are not as well off as Tony Collette and Adam Scott are. I'm trying not to pour shame and um they are they are deplorables in that basket as they, Ms. <laughs> so as madam <laughs> madam secretary hillary clinton stated yeah. they are in that basket of deplorables yeah. yeah uh and so they show up and uh they're three is it three kids how many kids do they have they have three four three. they have the four the two girls four yeah, yeah, yeah. The so they ha- right, right so they have a son who is obese and kind of a brat. Yeah, and, he, and then two he daughters. He doesn't talk in the film. He doesn't, does he not have one single line? He doesn't have one line. He has line. a couple he lines. No, I think he screams once when he gets pulled up the chimney. That's it. He, he does And he burps. That's it. He burps. Uh, two daughters who are, we find out a little bit later, the dad wants them to be boys. He wishes that he had sons. I took, I think this is really just looking at it through a... 2022 lens is i found that part to annoy me a little bit i found it to be a little homophobic transphobic just a little bit Why? but i can get the way the way that they were trying to paint them like not like even though that's just kind of like how how they are the joke was that they were not that they were acting like quote unquote boys I found like that whole aspect not to be anything like super big, but it was just something I picked up on more this, uh, this time I around. Yeah. I felt that it was the dad just was forcing them to be boys because he's so football obsessed. Yeah. So, you know, he never made it as a football player. So all of his kids are going to be into sports. And they, there's a line where they say like, like the girls get mad because of Max's letter and they're like, dad doesn't wish we were boys, but it's like really obvious the way he treats them that he wishes that they were boys. Um, So like, I, I didn't take it as like the girls. I just found, but the joke, but the joke and what they're trying to say is what I'm saying that I took, I didn't take major issue with with it. It was just something I picked up on, or I did take little issue with it. I was just commenting that. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean like go on that long. (laughs) Yeah. I, I didn't, I will say the one thing that I, I actually, Ed do to think is kind of like uh, is making their son uh who's like heavy set kind of not talk and all he wants to do is eat i was like why do they constantly do that like they, they always like paint people in bigger bodies and heavier set children as 
brats and mean and lazy and dumb, you know, when like, that's not really the case. Like that's a little, it's like, just like a little fat phobic for sure. And I was like, all right. No, it, it definitely is. I was a fat child and I was not like that. Uh, Michael Doherty did the same thing in trick or treat with the, the, uh, the little boy at the beginning who throws up blood and chocolate everywhere. And for right? a sec, yeah. I thought it was the same kid, but it's not, but uh, for right. Well, cause the kid would have been much older. Yeah. But no, it's, it's basically the same kid. Let's yeah. be honest. Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So they all arrive. And then they they surprise bring Aunt Dorothy, who's this gruff, grumpy, like trashy, drunk ass. <laughs> Who you know that we all would fucking want to hang out with at a bar. <laughs> uh, she's the if 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 Aunt Dorothy surprise walked into my home, I would be celebrating. Finally, a fucking interesting person walks into this yes, house. Yes, like, she's the perfect person that you would be sitting next to all night if this was like your boyfriend's family. Yeah. And you met her and you're like, I'm obsessed with Aunt yeah. Dorothy. Yeah. yeah. But because none of these characters are gay, they can't appreciate exactly. a, a, the <laughs> character know, of this magnitude. And gay, gay men love her because she's the aunt who doesn't treat you like a child. Therefore, yeah. would clock you being gay at a really young age and be like, you're gay. Like, get over it. Like, we're cool. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. You're cool. Fuck it. Like, drink. Do this. Treat you like an adult and, like, just be cool with you. You know? Like. That there's something assuring. But then also have like subtle funny jabs to be like, so how's the interior design? Uh like isn't that what you're what you're planning to do? Yeah. Right, right, right. Right. Like, no, I want to be an accountant. <laughs> Borderline <laughs> offensive. She's played by Conchata Farrell, who uh is a character actress who's done she shows up. She's in Edward Scissorhands as one of the nosy neighbors. She's in yep. Mystic Pizza. Also, you know, she random note, she's Will Farrell's daughter. Who's Will Fer- No, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> She's Pharrell's, the singer's mm-hmm. sister. I'm just kidding. Okay, shut, <laughs> shut up. up. Oh, she was in. She was in Buffy too. Was she really? I didn't watch yeah. Buffy. I, I'm a firm believer that you are a fan oh. of the movie or you're a fan of the show. And I saw the movie first, and I prefer it. Christy Swanson is a better Buffy than. Sarah Michelle Geller, okay, there I said, I don't, I don't fight want, me. Oh, wow. Okay, okay, bye. You're, you're just okay. glad a whole country has been between you two. Because <laughs> that's, that's, I that's, am, yeah. yeah no, don't forget, that's fine. you forget, Ricky, I'm, Paul, I'm going to stand up for you. You forget, Paul was a top for about a week. Okay, right? He ain't afraid right, of and you. Then he got, and then he got <laughs> locked He's out of his house. He's not afraid of you, so you watch what you're saying. <laughs> it's not my house, A. B, oh, that makes it better. Do not comfort, do not comfort SMG. <laughs> <laughs> I think her best performance is in Cruel Intentions, and I and I don't I just, disagree with you. I've like, not as been far a fan as Cruel of her Intentions, otherwise. Paul, Scream 2. Are we breaking up? Scream 2. I know what you did last summer. <laughs> yes, we are. She, I gotta go. She's great, and I know what you did last summer. She's oh, really she's great, and I know what you did she, last she, summer. She's fun. And her and... Freddie Prince are like really good parents and like really awesome. No, I know, people. I know, I know. They're cute. Yeah. Look, I just missed the boat on Buffy, but I I do like the movie. Um, that's all there is to it. I can't explain it. You know, I that's tried fine. to get the Buffy that's after fine. the fact, and I I just couldn't. All right, Awkward. let's move on. <laughs> Why don't we move forward with reading the plot then? Okay. I'm going yeah. to plug. I'm going to plug Buffy Gaze, which is a. Uh, an amazing podcast. They're I'm friends awesome. with these guys. I've been on a couple of times. I uh, actually was on to talk about the movie and then I'm going to be on uh, next month, but I'm just going to plug them because they're amazing. They're great. Buffy Gay's pod. They were on your podcast too, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. The I listened craft. to that one. Yep. They're the good. craft. So crafty. All right. The plot. <laughs> the plot. Max wants to continue family traditions, but tensions among his relatives sap their Christmas spirit. When his cousins read out his letter to Santa and mock him for still believing, he fights with them and yells out that he hates his family and even Christmas. Mm -hmm. His father comforts him by telling him that even though there is chaos during the holidays, he should always love his family. And he gives him his uh, and he gives him his letter to Santa. But in a fit of anger, Max tears up the letter and throws it to the wind outside, whereupon it is swept up into the sky. We didn't take a moment to talk about Omi, who is grandma, who, as the synopsis said, speaks mostly German. She's got like this chip on her shoulder. She's very old country, right? But also very sweet. She's got this lovely face. Yeah. Um, and she's she and really Max, nice. she's really nice. And Max and Max and her have clearly have a really lovely relationship, right? Yeah. 
she, she, I, he he speaks German. Like he understands when she speaks German. Yeah, she, he works as her translator. She reminds me of my grandma. Uh, like my relationship Aww. with my grandma. She's very sweet. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my cousins who don't speak Spanish completely 100% understand it. So they would have these very one like weird conversations where it was just Spanish, Spanish, Spanish. They would respond in English and my grandma would respond in Spanish. My cousins would translate, but then ask them to speak fucking Spanish and they'd be like, I don't know how. <laughs> That's cute. I, I did like That's, Omi. She's and I cool. like also that they kind of offset that stereotype. Like, I feel like they very easily could have made her like the mean German, like Austrian uh, grandmother. They could have made, made her like, like sweet. Yeah. yeah. And and I I really liked that. And I, I really liked that, that actress, too. Yeah. So she was found at the last minute. Two other actors were cast in the role before her and scheduling. I think it was scheduling. Uh, didn't work out. So she was found at the last minute. She doesn't really have any other notable credits. This is kind of the only big thing that she's done. Krista Stadler is her name. And she's great. She doesn't have a lot of speaking in the film, right? She doesn't speak much. It, she says incredible things with her face. You can see this sadness. You can see this, you know, she's got a story to tell in her face. Yeah. She doesn't have a lot of work done on her face, which actually works in making her very warm. <laughs> You know, she has she wrinkles. Def- it's good. Yeah, and she definitely gave me like I feel like she's probably done a lot of theater. Yeah, uh, and the, like I'm not surprised yeah. that she hasn't done. I think that she did theater for. I'm assuming she was probably a really big like theater actress, or even if it wasn't, you know, even if she wasn't Broadway or West End. But it's I definitely got the sense that she is like an act, like an actor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She like acted for the back of the audience, which is why her face is so expressive. So Max, the little boy, has written a letter to Santa. He's at that age where it's time to stop believing in Santa, right? We all know that age. When did you guys discover there was no Santa? Oh, God. My... I was four. Yeah. Oh, my um, God. I was and, okay. And I pretended to still, uh, to still believe because I thought maybe then I wouldn't get the presents. But the way that I found out is hilarious because... My brother-in-law, my sister is uh, 16 years old, 16 years older than me. And my brother-in-law, who like I've grown up, they've known each other since before I was born. And he dressed up as Santa. But he left like this bracelet on. So like he came, I was like four years old to like, my mom always used to throw these big Christmas Eve parties. And he came and I was like the only child. So this was like, this was really sweet. This was like for me. And he comes in <laughs> just as Santa and I'm like so excited. I sit on his lap and then I, I vividly remember this. I looked at his bracelet and then I looked up at him and I went, Bill, which I'm sure every adult at that party watched this. I was just because I clocked it immediately was like, what the f- like, I'm sure that must have been a really funny moment, but I knew for some reason in that moment, I just knew Santa wasn't real. And that, like, yeah, adults do this to trick you, like, is kind of like how I thought about it. And yeah, so that's how I found out. Yeah, I was five in the car and my dad was driving and I just heard him talking to my mom about something and she seemed kind of like annoyed and upset and he was like just so you know Pablo Santa Claus was a man named Nicholas who died about 300 years ago and now we pretend that he is real so that kids can act well but you need to act correct don't be a brat and you will and you'll get presents but Santa isn't real don't tell your cousins and that was it. Don't tell your cousin. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Oh my god! Oh my wow. god! And I was like, "Santa died." I think it was. He's like, in, I, was like I was thirty-two. So, <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I was in fifth grade, which is up there in age to still believe, maybe. And I found out my parents wrapped Santa's presents in the same wrapping paper as the presents that they were giving me from themselves, and I just put two and two together. And then when I called them on it, they denied it. And they tried to keep me believing in Santa. Uh, and then they finally told me, and uh, I was not allowed to tell my brother, obviously, he's a couple years younger than me. And that was that. And then I started questioning God and uh, Jesus and existence. And look at me now. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so, so Max has written a letter to Santa. And he is pretty blatantly honest in it his he they're all so they all sit down at the dinner table tony collette has made this insane gorgeous christmas dinner and she 
She goes off into the kitchen to make desserts. I love that she tells Aunt Dorothy to get what did she say? Just get out of my kitchen. Stay the like, fuck really, out of my kitchen. Yeah. Really yeah. hateful. Tony Collette also kills it in this role because we do see all the different levels and kind of the fakeness of her. And then when she's called on it, it reminded me very Julia Sugarbaker Southern Mother moment when she was like, her daughter's like, you literally said last year that they shouldn't breed or that there are some people that shouldn't breed. And she's like, I feel like you need to make, you need to take a test. <laughs> like, <laughs> or at first denies it. And she's like, no, I never said that. She's like, what I said, what? Well, she's she's very <laughs> relatable, right? Because she's stressed out. She's acting very stressed out. And she's also kind of like us, right? Where we're like, yeah, some people like, fuck, why did you have kids? You're, you're rotten. Your kids are fucking rotten. Like, ugh, you know? And like, you just kind of say shit, put it in your mouth. Like, put your foot in your mouth. And then you're like, ugh, maybe I should have walked that back a little bit. My fucking sister brought this bitch ass aunt. Yeah. I'm gonna kill her. And her kids and then... are brats and her husband's intolerable. Yeah. In many ways. I, mean, I love also that we learn about Adam Scott. He's in his like office by himself pouring whiskey into a coffee mug. Yeah. And so you know there's like a lot of untapped things. There is there is a lot of implication that you have to drink to get through the holidays with family in yeah, this movie. For sure. Uh for sure. Uh we also learn that Adam Scott and Tony Collette's brother uh brother-in-law don't get along at all. I mean they're super different people. Adam Scott is, you know, a together a together and smart human being. <laughs> Tony Collette's brother-in-law is a maga trash and mm -hmm. uh teases Adam Scott for being an eagle scout. But this comes in handy because it means that Adam Scott has some survival skills, right? Whereas the MAGA guy actually has nothing. Nothing in the in the face of crisis can't do shit. Yeah, he's right. He's complete... He he oh, he carries guns and he acts like a big shot and like a toxic masculine macho asshole. And then when it, when he's faced with crisis, he can't do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, which is. A, I mean, very the most realistic thing about yeah, this movie. So incompetent, can't protect his own family, and actually needs Adam yeah. Scott to protect his family. Yeah, but, yeah. But hey, guys, let's not take the guns away from from the good people. You need a good guy with a gun. Calm down. <laughs> no, I uh, hate so people Mac like that. <laughs> Max has written a pretty, um, it's not a mean letter, it's not a mean spirited letter, but he says some, you know, some things that you wouldn't want people to hear you say about them, right? Talking about, he says, he says, dear Santa, please help my family. I wish that my parents would follow, were still in love. Uh, I wish that my uncle didn't wish that his daughters were boys. I wish, you know, please make things easier for my aunt and uncle. And it's implying like th that they're poor and they're struggling. He's giving this like good, well-meaning wish, but it's just kind of things you would tell your therapist that you wouldn't say to someone actually. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so his cousins rip, rip the letter out of his hands at the dinner table and they read it out loud in front of everybody and it hurts everybody's feelings. And then yeah. Tony Collette comes in with a tray full of desserts and says, who wants creme brulee? And well, everyone's got this sour puss on their face. I and Dorothy. And Dorothy's the only one who's like, bless him. He's the only one who's saying what we're all thinking or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love, love when Tony Collette opens up, like, who wants creme brulee? Like, it is, so I love that moment. That moment cracks me up for some reason. Maybe it's my waspy upbringing. <laughs> no, it's I, no, no, it's real. Listen, she's just so good at everything, and she, she just always knows what movie she's in. Yeah, well, it's, it's right. It's also good writing and good timing, right? They're, they're like they're doing yeah. all these things. She's she's already set up that she's in the kitchen, have to get away from all these people. Also, we just set up the joke that her brother in law and her aunt were like, "Couldn't you just have made fucking." <laughs> macaroni and cheese with hot dogs instead of right. this crap that no one can pronounce you know yeah. and then boom like it's just beat after beat after beat that is set up so well totally. when they walk in and they're like oh we brought this and it's like macaroni like like th that food that she d had just described and you just see her look of disgust that she if it tries <laughs> quickly tries to hide <laughs> yeah and also creme brulee is not an easy dessert have you ever tried to make custard because it's fucking hard yeah, it is hard <laughs> yeah yeah no. yeah and then you have that that uh fucking torch and everything Blow torch my, to, yeah. my yeah. sisters and i used to make it every now and then uh 
It's not easy to make. Not easy at all. So this is when the movie becomes a horror movie, right? Max, uh, Max is embarrassed and angry and he screams at his family. I hate you. I hate Christmas. This is, you're all terrible people. And he runs away, mm-hmm. which if I had done that as a child would have gotten my ass kicked. Um, oh yeah. He runs to his room and his dad brings in the letter, tries to explain to him that Christmas is hard. It doesn't mean everybody doesn't love each other. And Max is having none of it. So when his dad leaves his room, he takes the letter, he rips it up into tiny pieces, and then he throws it out the window. And we get this magical, spooky moment of the sky starting to turn gray and the letter kind of gets swept up in the wind and flies into the gray, snowy clouds. There's a line that Max says that I think is like... So, essentially... The movie is about the loss of hope. Like, that's what summons Krampus. You lose yeah. the hope that of what Christmas was. The line that Max says right before he rips it up and throws it out, I think is like the, boom, this is where it happens. Where his dad is like, you know, your family. And he says something like, just because you're related to them doesn't, like, just you share DNA. Just because you share DNA doesn't mean you like, you, you know, like he, he, like went from like caring about like he you know one of the reasons he fought that boy was because he was telling the little kids that santa wasn't real and it's important to keep the christmas spirit alive for the look like he's very loving he's very giving he's very sensitive and then the big change is showcased by him saying just because you share dna doesn't mean you have to like care about these people you know like and that wasn't who he was he was very much very different that is like, you know, the ripping up of the letter, I think, is just to show that something's about to happen. But I think that's the point where Krampus is like, Mur, here we go. Well, I think this, yeah, I completely agree. And I think that this also shows, you know, he tries so hard to keep his family together. Yeah. And now at this point, he's just at his wit's end because you hear him earlier. He's like, wait, wait, aren't we going to... Uh, watch the wrap wrap Christmas presents and watch the Charlie Brown exactly uh, Christmas and he just tries so hard he gets to kind of like his mom almost where she tries to like be like outwardly like this for her it's a little bit more outward versus inward yeah but and then just has to eventually just kind of turn it off and with him he kind of does the same thing too but a little bit in reverse if that makes sense exactly and he really cares and he's just He's like, fuck it, I'm done. And the contents I... of his Santa letter were really very touching and very beautiful. Like, it wasn't about, you know, I want this toy, I want that toy. It was, I want the relationship with my sister that we had before. I want my parents to fall in love and like each other again. I want things to be easy for my aunt and uncle. And I, and like, I actually think it was very sweet of him to say, I wish that my uncle didn't want his daughters to be boys like i wish that he essentially i wish he just accepted them for who they were because it it's very painful to these girls to try to be forced into something that they're not and so like he's a very nice person he's very sweet so he's even like loving on his family even though he doesn't like them he still has a lot of love for them so that's why i think it hits even harder when he's like just because we share dna he doesn't even say we're family he says we share dna it's so so clinical so scientific so sterile fuck you know like okay that was the last piece the last piece of like christmas hope and love and everything and tradition that down the drain but he's not wrong i do kind of relate to him though like i don't really have a relationship with my blood family but i have found my tribe and i feel like yeah that's kind of where this kid is headed you know (laughs) yeah for sure he's He's kind of the voice of reason, like, throughout pretty much the entire movie. Like, because he's yeah. not wrong. DNA, one thing or, like, doesn't matter. I have, like, my siblings are half, half quote-unquote, half siblings. And I hate that term so yeah, much. Yeah, it's just Because it's diminutive. And I think that, like you said, especially in the queer community, a lot of, you know, people are, don't have close relationships with their, quote-unquote, you know, DNA, blood family and they that's why the term like chosen family uh is is very popular and not popular in our community it's a big part of our community yeah it's essential mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh so moving forward with the plots later that night a severe blizzard engulfs the town causing a power outage 
When Beth ventures out to check on her boyfriend, a large horned creature chases her. She hides behind a delivery truck, but the creature leaves a jack in the box, which attacks her and gives the impression she is killed. Uh, yeah, I think she is killed. <laughs> well, she goes, to, yeah, that was kind of scary. So the, the basically the clouds turn super gray and there is an insane snowstorm. It's Wild. real bad. They uh, The snow was made out of multiple elements, but the snow that's on the ground was made up of shredded diapers. Oh, that is so which cool. I think made the set probably smell really fucking weird. Like a fresh diaper has a weird plasticky smell, right? Oh, it does. Yeah, it does. You could you could just tell it was so fake and weirdly fake. There's a part later where Adam Scott's face has like it's like almost like Batman and Robin e like <laughs> like how fake their uh like the snow looks and it's on just one side of his face. People can't hear it as I'm like tapping my right, face. Right, right. <laughs> but it's just on one side and you could tell that it's just glued onto his face and it, I I thought it was good. It was cheesy. The whole movie was filmed on a or most of it was filmed on a sound stage. Yeah, yeah, the only on location moment was the store at the opening credits. Do you know what store that yes. was? No, I I, I don't Do you... know. Either. Oh, I thought you were gonna tell us. No, yeah, I'm like uh, right. I'm like it's Mr. S. Leather. No, I don't know. <laughs> so the sister Beth. Uh, oh my God, you guys, Mr. S. Leather is in San Francisco, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. We have the Leather Man here in New York on Christopher Street, uh, which is iconic. But Mr. S. Leather is like the store. Yeah. Chris and I both modeled for them at separate times. <laughs> That's so cool. That's weird. We're like, Ugh, that I used to, I used to, I used to go go dance at the New York Eagle uh, Ooh, back in my youth, yes. back when I was a hot young thing. Same. I have a really cool stuff. picture. One, it was Valentine's Day one time, and I was dancing on the pool table, and they were, I had uh, angel wings on my back because it was Valentine's Day, like Cupid, and they were showing. Um, Barbarella, uh, like Ooh. projecting it on the wall behind me, Ooh. and I was in Next Magazine with me, like dancing with my arms up in a harness with wings on, with Pygar, the angel and Barbarella, oh, on the screen behind so me. So cool! Send us that Coolest picture. That picture like in the world. Yes, so I, I want to see this so badly. <laughs> I can't. I looked for it a few months ago. I cannot find my copy of Next Mag. Like Next Magazine is out of print now, but. I can't find it anywhere. Well, I, I'm sure I have it in a looking. box somewhere. Keep looking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, if, if, right. if you see it, I'd love to see it. That sounds like a really fun picture. It was a cool picture. It was a great picture. Uh, and a cool moment in my life. Yeah. Back when I was a, a little whore dancing <laughs> for money. <laughs> dancing for money. Right. Was. It was. was. <laughs> uh, ain't nobody paid to see this dance anymore. No, whatever. I jiggle when I wiggle now. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. Don't say uh, that. So the movie, the movie. Beth is the sister and she's just obsessed with her boyfriend. And he lives a few blocks away and she can't get a hold of him now that there's a blizzard. So she's like, I have to go check on my boyfriend. And leaves. And we see as she's kind of walking down the street in the middle of this blizzard, which I don't understand why she or anyone would go outside. We see a horned creature with a hunchback jumping from rooftop to rooftop. And it's pretty cool. This is our first time seeing Krampus. We don't see anything about his face, yeah. just a really striking silhouette. A lot of imagery of, of the traditional Krampus is, um, can't stop it. No. <laughs> A lot of imagery of the traditional Krampus is that he is very kind of tall and very skinny. Yeah. And this guy is hunched over. He looks ancient, right? And hunched got over. An open he's got mouth. A big hump on his back and a gaping wide open mouth, which we'll get to later. Out eyes, yeah. Because there's, I have, I have feelings about his face design that I'm not in love with it. Uh, but as a silhouette and as a general design. He looks pretty cool, especially leaping. He's so big and so heavy that the fact that he can leap from rooftop to rooftop is pretty cool. Yeah. Beth starts screaming and running and for some reason finds herself underneath a delivery truck hiding from this creature. It's the DHL Um, guy from that that we saw earlier, right? It's like his delivery truck because he delivers some toys or some stuff. And the the sister says like, oh, they got something like another fancy thing again. And then, boom, there are, um, there's like a big bag, a sack a of sack. like presents. Yeah. And she's like, that too. And he's like, that's not from me. So like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's this guy. I have I questions about, about all this stuff. Like I'm trying yeah. to well, figure Some out, of it like, is not as clear as it should be. Yeah. And I'll be like, I, there, some of this movie flows poorly and mm-hmm. 
to the point where it's not leaving it ambiguous. It's just bad storytelling, in my opinion. Anyway, she looks in what? the truck, and this guy's frozen solid with a scream, like like his mouth is open, like he was screaming when he froze. Yeah. She crawls underneath the truck to try to hide, and she looks behind her, and there's this itty bitty tiny Jack in the Box behind her, and it it plays music. I think it's a, some Christmas song, and it it slowly opens up and slowly a, a, a Jack like Jack in the Box comes. Did up. I say a Jack o' Lantern was behind her? No. You said, I, I no. don't know, but it's a Jack in the Box. <laughs> it's a Jack in the Box, not a pumpkin. Yeah. Uh, and so the the Jack slowly starts to come up, and then we see her feet get dragged underneath the truck. Yep. She's a t- I will say, I did kind of like this scene for a couple of reasons. I found it really tense. I found it to be one of the more horror moments. But also, I like it's implied that she's dead. I, yeah. I think it's pretty sure. And that moment also is a good kind of turning point where it is kind of like the drew barrymore and scream kind of okay because she's the daughter yeah like so it, and she's like what you think is going to be a bigger character and kind of more and she's done like yeah. and she dies so kind of all bets yeah. are off well paul she gives a good chase scene too paul, she a you really love chase a chase scene, scene. and th- this was like a good chase scene. it was actually set up well it was a good effective traditional horror chase scene and like yeah, a good yeah. traditional horror the chasing and she dies <laughs> like it's great you know if it was rated r we would have seen blood but it's pg-13 so they just don't show blood but yeah right, right, right. but it was just tense yeah like, it was good the scariness like came from and she had a good scream mm-hmm. she screamed really yeah. well when the jack-o'-lantern starts to come up or jack-in-the-box head <laughs> the jack and the jack-in-the-box starts to come up she the, dies so she the... gets jacked off <laughs> okay. The blizzard. The the blizzard. I knew that was back. coming. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> coming. Oh god. The blizzard effect is clearly CGI, but it looks really cool. Yeah. It, you know, I think the houses are all CGI as well. Because oh, the, the okay. film, it was filmed on a soundstage, so yeah, it's a pretty much entirely CGI setting, but it looks decent. Yeah. Uh, next up in the plot, when she does not return home within the hour deadline, her mom set, Tom and Howard leave to search for Beth. They find her boyfriend's house in ruins with the chimney split open and large goat-like hoof prints in the house. Outside, the two are attacked by an unseen snow monster hidden in snow. Tom saves Howard from the monster by shooting it with Howard's gun. They return home and board up the windows and everybody tries to get some sleep, except Howard, who volunteers to stand guard. Yep. But he falls asleep. Tony Collette's like, not without my daughter. A Krampus ate my baby. <laughs> not without my daughter. Okay. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and you know, so the uh, Adam Scott and the MAGA uncle say, we're going to go look for her. It's only a block. You know, it's just around the corner. It's a couple blocks away. We're going to go. And they jump into the Hummer, right? What's his, uh, the MAGA guy? Lucinda. Lucinda, the, yeah, the like giant gas-guzzling SUV yeah. to go find her. And when they get to the boyfriend's house, it's in shambles and all screwed up. There's a gingerbread stabbed through the... Um... Yeah, a gingerbread cookie is stabbed kind of through the heart yep. up against up against the wall. Refrigerator. It's the refrigerator, oh, wow. and nobody can... They they don't know what the hell happened here, but we all know what happened here. Yeah. Well, and then there's that weird like that weird creature, right? That's like in it's like fucking Tremors style, right? And like, do we ever yeah. see yeah. what that is? We never see what it is. It's a snow monster. Think Bugs Bunny traveling underground. Yeah. And you get like I'll... kind of the, the dirt raising up. Yeah. We it's 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 pretty cool. It is... And I I like that we don't see it. And it comes back later. It takes one I of the elves it, later too, which was these wild. monsters. Right. These like monster minions are hit or miss. Like some hit of or them miss. Are dead exactly, and, or they suck. Yeah, totally agree. Uneven in creature design. I like the idea of this. Again, I think with better cinematography, it would have worked. Yeah. It's just this movie has so many tight close-ups of people's faces that you can't see what's happening to them. And it might be by design. Yeah, it might be. Sure. I'm sure it's by on purpose. Yeah. They had the budget to, sh- I mean, they show creatures in this movie the, mm-hmm. and puppet and animatronic work is excellent. Yes. Right. 
and uh, just the focus on using puppets and animatronics and, and live, you know, present creatures instead of CGI is very admirable. I don't understand why the cinematography doesn't show you clearly what's happening around yeah. these people. Uh, anyway, it, uh, so the, the idea is that this, this snow creature uh, comes up and will snatch you and drag you under the snow and then you're done for. Yeah, and it takes and, uh, Uncle Howard... Right. Takes Uncle Howard, uh, but Adam Scott uses his gun. Howard's gun, shoots the thing, and it burrows away. Mm-hmm. They um, they get back to the house and tell everybody, I don't know what the hell's going on here, but we need to board up the windows. Adam Scott takes charge. He's got big daddy energy right now. Yeah, he does. Uh, and says we have to right because he's that e- he's got the Eagle Scout training. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> It's very your next, like when you like they throw that in early on, or I've uh, never seen your next. So it's oh. a brilliant film. It's really good. I know, I know, super underrated. I, I, I missed, I missed it. I need to see it because who is it? Horror Daddies just did an episode on it. I think it's really didn't good. they? Uh, I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did. They're great. We're going to be on each other's podcasts in January. I'm Ooh, so excited. Fun. Ooh, they're so cool. They're good guys. Uh, so they decide to go to sleep and one person will stand guard. I don't understand that. I would not fall asleep. There's no possible way. If my daughter's missing, if it's a weird blizzard and there are snow monsters outside and we've boarded up the windows, there's no way I'm going to sleep. Yeah. Uncle Howard is going to stand guard, right? There's a point where they, um, the, I don't remember his name, the obese child of Uncle Howard is nervous and upset and Max shares his Halloween candy stash with him. And in that box of Halloween candy is Sam's little jack-o'-lantern lollipop that he uses to kill people. So Michael Doherty put a trick or treat. That's cool. uh, Easter egg in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, Which is cute. I love that Michael Doherty has this like iconic character that people have embraced. I think he wanted that to happen with Krampus, his design of Krampus, and it just didn't take Mm -hmm. off, unfortunately. Yeah. So later, after Howard falls asleep, a large hook with a living gingerbread man attached lures Howie Jr. to the chimney. He takes a bite of the gingerbread man, but it comes to life and is dragged up the chimney despite the family's efforts to save him. Meanwhile, a fire log is inadvertently kicked aside during their struggle to save Howie, setting the tree in presence ablaze. So yeah, Pablo, as you said, this like meat hook looking thing comes down the chimney and there's a gingerbread, living gingerbread man attached to it. The one from Shrek. Yeah, I just kept thinking it's like once from Shrek, and they look the same quality. They basically they they do. Seth Green voices one of these gingerbread yeah. men, just so funny That's to me. Funny. Uh, they have these like me 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 like high pitched little yeah. little silly voices. They don't really say words; they just make grunting noises. They're funny. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are funny. I actually like them in the movie. Yeah. Uh, but of course, because Howie Junior is a little fat boy. <laughs> We're fat shaming him in this movie. He is attracted to the gingerbread man and goes and tries to take a bite of him. But he gets dragged up the chimney. Everyone starts to wake up. Tony Collette grabs him by the feet and she starts to get dragged up. And she gives such a great performance compared to the rest of this movie. (laughs) This movie didn't deserve her. (laughs) And uh, she, when she, so she looks up and she sees the gingerbread men and screams. She makes faces in this scene that are very reminiscent of the screaming faces that she makes in hereditary. Like when she gets pulled out of the chimney and saved, her face is exactly the same face as that iconic screaming face. That's made memes all over the internet. Yes. Uh, Tries to tell people what she's seen and can't describe it. And then of course the Christmas tree does go up in flames. We get a good shot of a Santa ornament falling to the ground. So next up, Omi, the grandma, explains that the creature hunting them is Krampus, an ancient demonic spirit who punishes those who have lost the Christmas spirit. Omi recounts that when she was a child, her parents and community lost their spirit due to the hardships of the war in Europe. She also lost hope and wished for her parents to be taken away. This wish summoned Krampus. He was... He and his helpers dragged everyone except her to hell, leaving behind a bell bobble with his name on it. The family remained skeptical until monstrous toys hidden in presents delivered earlier invade the house. Upstairs, Stevie and Jordan are lured to the attic by Beth's voice. Downstairs, the adults hear them screaming. Tom, Sarah, and Linda go up to investigate, only to find Jordan being eaten by Der Clown, 
the Jack in the Box from before. The family fends off the toys and the gingerbread men, but Krampus's elves leap in through a window, taking Dorothy and Chrissy. Howard, desperate to get his kids back, jumps on their clown's back and then disappears after. So a lot happens real fast. The movie yeah. starts to get that shit crazy. Yeah. But I want to start talking about Omi's story. I have a yes. I love the story. I just also have a lot of questions. The first one being, how the fuck does Adam Scott not know about this? Yeah, like he would like, know how that his has mom's a, a, an orphan. But he he does yeah. say she gets weird during all every Christmas. He just never knew why, right? But doesn't he eventually one year stop believing in Santa? I guess maybe he, like, it wasn't as dramatic, or maybe there just wasn't family drama for right. her to bring it up. But it was yeah. Th- th- there's a difference, I think, in this movie between stopping believing in Santa and losing hope in Santa. Yeah, losing. So one of the things that I found really interesting, and maybe it actually goes back to Omi, and ma- because Omi, like la- later on. Omi kind of she acts almost like this is all her fault so a lot of the things that happen in this film is they never want to tell the kids what's happening they never want to talk about anything both sets of parents actually don't want to scare the they, they don't they actually aren't including the children in the family discussions especially because um this is terrifying your sister might be dead this guy is missing and like when Tony Collette like hears the story, she doesn't tell anyone she saw a gingerbread man attack her. Like she doesn't say that. They don't share anything that they're experiencing. They don't talk about it with the kids. The only time then someone breaks it and starts to talk is one when Max tells everyone what he's actually thinking, cusses them all out, and then when Omi tells the story. But everything throughout there, they don't tell them. They don't let the kids know that the uncle got bit. He says he's fine. Like, they don't talk about anything. And I actually think that's part of the problem here in this that's film. Right. And I hadn't noticed that. I hadn't noticed that. Yeah. I mean, on a couple levels, right? Parents don't tell their children the truth about Santa, but also this family is just not communicating at all. They're not. They're they're, they're not doing yeah. anything. And, like, the, the fact that the son doesn't know that his mom witnessed her parents get killed. Like, he doesn't know anything about that. He doesn't know anything about Hello, his mom. That's so very observant of you. Didn't you used to be, like, a psychiatrist or a therapist? Therapist, so yeah, therapist. Therapist, yeah. yeah. That, and then, like, Until you lost your license, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your exactly. your no, license was revoked. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then, but, like, the only one who's, like, curious about the family and curious what people are talking about is Max, right? And he keeps yeah. wanting to find out. But he's also the one telling them, I'm seeing these snowman i'm seeing these things all this stuff is happening and they're like yeah 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 they're kind of like it's very like children are uh seen not heard and then the parents kind of try to mask everything but the reality is they're not connecting they're not they're not actually sharing in anything you know it's yeah. tony like you you guys mentioned tony collette tony collette's character is perfect she is going through the motions but she's actually inside isn't buying into it she hates these people she hates her sister she feels like her sister never should have had children she's like she hates her daughter's boyfriend but she's like doing all the things on the surface right and so everything in this family is just on the surface it's wild if there's any like if you can attribute culture (laughs) a culture of white people it's this yeah it's very waspy like 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 Hide your emotions. Hush. Like, yeah. And that, very, very hush hush. Like it's that's like, that that's one thing that I kind of felt because I was like, the these two families represent, I think, something really like a very American thing, right? Like you don't talk mm-hmm. about stuff, but you also have this like um very right wing family oh. and then very left wing or left leading, because you know, the 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 More softness moderate. of the dad kind of lets us think like, okay, probably voted for Obama and like all this stuff, right? And then they're, <laughs> they're clashing. No one is actually connecting and no one wants to connect. They just want to go through the motions. And that's the problem. And it's it's a theme that I wish the movie did a better job of showcasing. Yeah. It, I, I, I sound like I don't like this movie. I'm just, I'm allowed to criticize it because I do like it so much. And oh, yeah. I just wish it were, I wish it were that much better. I love Omi's storytelling. She starts in German and Max translates and then she switches to speaking English and fucking xenophobic Aunt Dorothy looks at her and goes, English. I knew it. I knew it. So good. I love that line. It's so <laughs> fucking 
but so the movie switches to being animated and it's computer gen it's cgi it's um 3d animation but in the style of stop motion animation hearkening back to the old christmas classics that we love it's very like, beautiful, beautiful animation it's, it's so, so beautiful. gorgeous and it show you know it shows young little girl omi who is animated now taking bread off of a bread truck in Europe and, you know, everyone's very poor and then people steal the bread from her and you see the town lose hope because of the war that's happening around them. And uh, she's in her bed that night and Krampus comes to her home and she witnesses from her bed Krampus taking her family and he peeks into her bedroom and winks at her and it's just his shadow animated. You don't see his face or anything. And he has left behind this little bobble or this little ornament that's kind of like a like a dark looking jingle bell with his name on it. Yeah. As a yeah. reminder. It really is a cool, unexpected sequence. You know, she tells the story very well as an actor. She's excellent. What and... was really unexpected, what was really unexpected was. was that we learned that she was a brunette. Um, oh my god, shut guessed. the fuck up. I was Aryan just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what okay, so the like the point of the story is to tell us like Krampus is real. He comes, he's the antithesis, he's the anti-Santa. And what Krampus does is he leaves a witness behind. Yes. And, she had wished for her parents to be taken away because they had lost the Christmas and so, spirit. Like Santa, he grants wishes. Unlike Santa, his wishes are punishments. You know, and, or like the wishes he grants grants are punishments, and so that was kind of interesting. So that that's important to know because then we're then as audience members we're told this is what to expect because now we're getting this, and um, that's why the the ending is so different. So and like while we don't see what happens to her family and her town, we're about to see it happen here in present like present day life family does not believe her story really they're like oh she's old she crazy but then shit starts going fucking crazy yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh the uh the two uh sisters of uncle howard who are treated like boys are lured upstairs they hear beth max's sister's voice summoning them and they head up there and <laughs> Well, I, I I love this creature. I thought this was one of the I most, do too. And this is the most iconic creature design, right? This yeah. One. So it's a, the, okay, that's yeah. that tiny jack o' lantern box coming out of it is it, it it grows and gets big, almost like a tremor. You said it right, or like this worm like kind of cloth body, and then a, a clown head that's really huge, but its mouth opens almost like the predator. Yeah. Right. And three different. And guys. it's got this while, while the head is made of maybe porcelain or something. Uh, the, the mouth inside of it is organic biological kind of like gross teeth, pink meaty skin. Yeah. It just, it looks awesome. And it's great. We see it swallowing um, uh, jo- Jordan. I, I, yeah. I didn't show it. And we just see him like, gah, 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 like hella like Unhinging python, his jaw like a snake would. Like a yeah. python and just like swallowing the feet and everyone's like, what the fuck? And then as, you know, they they shoot at it and then we get the cherub who is wild looking. <laughs> like it's demon. Like that, the angel on it, like the angel on top of a tree that's... turned into a monster. <laughs> exactly. And it's got yeah. these like dingy, gross wings like they're dirty like a like a like a pigeon's wings exactly would be, right that attacks tony collette the, like the feathers on it are gross the teddy bear attacks um lisa or whatever like tony collette's sister and then sarah sarah thank you and then the like toy the like robot toys what attacks adam adam's character so they're all yeah. three fighting their own demons and it's just wild because this is when we see all of the creatures and we see uh, the trio of fucking <laughs> <laughs> gingerbread <laughs> shooting nail guns first of all what the fuck was a nail gun doing in the kitchen <laughs> i don't know that's a, no i thought that too so uncle howard is downstairs in the kitchen being attacked by these gingerbread men yeah which is while the other adults are upstairs trying to save the the sisters yeah but one of them's already been devoured the other one's tied up in christmas lights mm-hmm. uh, and wet she's and... like weirdly slimy there's like something on her it, yeah it was weird um 
These um, pictures are fine. Like this part was fun. This is fun. It is though. fun. I love I love the sequence. I love the puppetry. I love the animatronics. Uh, I love that the the MAGA ant gets her moment where she picks up like is it a baseball bat or no she picks up an axe right and she's like give me and back she, my daughter <laughs> yeah and she like she swings and hits the robot off of Adam Scott's back and then she like goes for the Jack in the Box and goes to, well see if she had not taken the moment to say give me back my kid would have gotten she would have gotten it but she swings and misses and it it drags the other daughter down like an air vent yeah. It was lost forever. Lost forever. It's 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 uh, wild. So now we have one one of the girls. So now that that family's lost two kids. They got two kids left. They come right. down. They still have the baby at this point. Yeah. The newborn is still with them. I don't know where it is. Uh, Omi, does Omi have it? That stressed me out. The baby baby being there just stressed me out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, what I don't like is the lack of grief or being upset when a child is lost, like when. Howie Jr. gets pulled up the tree, Howard, and maybe it's just the, maybe it's just the extent of the acting abilities of the actor, who's not, a, he's, he's well cast, right? But there's, he's just kind of like, I lost my kid, and that's it. Like you, you, like, you would be wailing, you would be moaning, you would be freaking the fuck out. Well, he, it, would he be that, though? Like, would he, he's such a toxic man, would he be like, Ugh. he just seems like he's like, Ang- like he's just annoyed and angry and like i feel like that's how someone like that would act like they would hide their emotions because he feels emotions are bad like he tells adam driver's character i'm sorry i thought you were spineless <laughs> like you were nothing yeah. you were small when in reality like he's the one who's actually protecting everyone and he's the one who saved your life he's saving everyone's life so far like he's the only one who's fucking doing something right you keep fucking it all up and you're getting hurt and you can't protect your own family dude um, and so like, I feel like, yeah, he, he wouldn't be like wailing for the most part. Uh, I think I, I just took it as he would just be like, I have to like hold it in and I have to prove that I'm a man, but he fails at it. Cause he's incompetent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also I think, I mean, this is all such a frenzy that yeah. I would imagine also there's a, like something to be said for, you don't have a lot of time to really process stuff like that just yet you're being attacked by jack still... in the boxes and <laughs> gingerbread men. Yeah. i do i love the last the last standing because the other two gingerbread men get caught on fire how does he catch them on fire he burns them no he shoots a lantern that they were right in front of they were yeah 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 yeah, yeah. but then there's a third one and it's got a sharpened candy cane he's like it leaps up toward howard and it's gonna <laughs> spear him with this candy cane and then their stupid, their stupid dog. Rosie. Is it a pug or a pip? Is there a, it's an American bulldog. It's a bulldog. Their bulldog eats it, which I think is funny. It's cute. And she's like, hop, 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 hop. I was so happy for her. <laughs> so what essentially happens next is they all like congregate in the um, uh, living room. And they're like, fuck. Right, right, right. And they're trying to figure out what to do. They're going to go out. They're going to try to do something. They can't because it's right. dangerous. They they boarded up the house. They realize like the thing is stuck inside the house because they boarded the house up. So the Jack in the Box can't leave. When we hear noise and then all the elves break in. The elves take the baby. They take yeah. the the ant. And um, as they're all leaving, like we see the the Jack in the Box come down and it comes up and it's in the house and it's like clapping as all the elves come in. Howard then jumps on top of the Jack in the Box as it's like going out of the window. And he's like, give me back my kids or whatever. And then that's right. Yeah. Because who is the one who says elves? <laughs> like or who delivers Grandma. that line? Omi. She goes, uh, <laughs> she knows exactly who they are. So she Adam Scott throughout all of this though keeps saying, Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> You've gotta be joking. Like he's kind of giving the reaction that the audience would be giving, which I think is a gateway into letting us laugh at what's happening. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I letting us it. know not to take it as seriously as, yeah. as you know. And it's it's Adam Scott who like his character who's like, I'm going to go to the snowplow. That's the only thing that we realized that had keys in it. And I'm going to make way so everyone can get out. Like, I ha- I made a plan. I'm the only one that can actually save you guys. And so that's right. the plan. But before that could happen is when all every, like, the, those fucking crazy looking elves, like, come So in. the elves have kind of horns. They are shrouded in, like, 
brown dirty rags and they wear these wooden carved masks which are traditional in these krampus parades that happen yep. in in austria right Germany, on the on december yeah. 5th uh men dress up as krampus and take yeah. to the streets to frighten children and they wear these traditional looking masks they've become a little more modern recently it's really cool you should look up on youtube these krampus parades they're really remarkable they're, the costumes that these people put they're together interesting. yeah uh chrissy yeah one of the elves takes chrissy the baby and runs away and dorothy gets grabbed by the chains the chains right and she has a gun and she shoots she shoots the teddy bear right when she gets dragged out the window by the chains it's a really badass <laughs> moment I love it. Uh, and and uh, she, she, she's like resigned to her thing. She's like, well, we, the, yep. The, we, I'm going out. I'm, if I'm going out and taking this, yeah, and with me. She, she's essentially like, we all deserve this. Yeah. <laughs> she's the best character. Yeah. <laughs> she really, I, I just wish the movie were about her. Uh, and then the ant gets dragged out and eaten by a snow monster as well. Yeah. So as they're walking, um, they start getting chased by a snow monster. Cause now it's just the ant, her daughter, Tony Collette, Max, and Adam Adam's character. Oh, well, you know what? Then let's go back a minute. Because Omi, uh, everybody, Adam's like, or Daddy is like, you know, we have to get to the snowplow. It's our only chance. Tony's like, you're right. It's our only option. We got to go right now. And Omi tricks locks them, them out. Yep, she locks she them tricks out. Them. She's like, let's go. And then she locks the door. And 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 Adam Scott is is crying. No, come on, we have to leave. And Max takes his dad aside and says she wants to face him. Yeah, right. Like Omi has to Omi has to bury this hatchet with Krampus. Imagine <laughs> seeing Adam Scott cry for his mom. Bo- like 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 that part like choked me up yeah, a little bit he when devastated. he's just screaming, "Mom!" Like- yeah, well, because he's always so goofy and he's always kind of a nerd, you know, like a goofy, cute nerd. Yeah. And and now he's got this moment and he does a great job. Mm-hmm. So Omi is locked in the house. She approaches the chimney or the fireplace and it starts to crack as though something massive is coming down it. And it's a really, it's a really cool reveal of what Krampus looks like, right? This is going to be our first big view of Krampus. <laughs> uh, he sticks his horns out from the fireplace and uh emerges and it's great he's got these long creepy spindly i love when the fingers like i love when the fingers come out and like just like get on the walls they're so long and it's a down shot as though we're looking great manicure great i was like (laughs) oh girl those nails yes queen he stands and walks up to Omi and we see his face for the first time. Now his face design is supposed to imply that he is wearing the face of an old bearded man to either like make, um, to imitate Santa Claus or to perhaps mock Santa Claus. Yeah. Michael Doherty has refused to ever say whose face it is. So it is allegedly somebody's face. What I don't. And so you can see, the creature's eyes behind this face and he sticks his long forked tongue out at Omi. So you see his tongue. What I don't like about this design is that if he's wearing somebody's face, why do we see the teeth of the face that he's wearing? Like, is he wearing this person's jaws also to say one more thing? The first time I saw this, I didn't realize he was wearing somebody's face. I didn't realize that. I thought that was, Krampus's face and that he was just so ancient that he just couldn't move his face. I that it didn't read to me as he's wearing a face mask. I thought he was supposed to be like a corpse version of Santa Claus that didn't yeah. move. Like yeah. the face like itself does not move. I didn't know that and he was I wearing a face. I just wish if that were the case, we never get a reveal of what Krampus's that face actually looks like. We should have gotten that. I think they do that intentionally though. They do. They do. Yeah. Or like kind of keep a little bit of mystery of like what Krampus actually what But if Michael like. Dortry wanted to have like Krampus to be an iconic character, he kind of shot himself in the foot by doing this. Agreed. I do, because in, in Trick or Treat, we finally get to see Sam's real face, right? Yeah. He wears a mask through the whole movie, and then we get the great mm-hmm. reveal where he's like a, a living gourd. Yep. Like, he's like a pumpkin with like a real face exactly. on it, and it's so cool looking. I, I just wish we got that in this movie, because it did not read to me, and maybe many people, that that's not actually his face, yeah. that he's wearing a mask. I didn't know that. So You know what I realized the second time I watched this? This is when I came up with the term cramp pussy. <laughs> Because I watched it, I was like, Omi's trying to get her cam- her, her, her cramp pussy licked and or fingered with those giant fingers. I was like, she's like, 
You know what? It's been a few years. And the long licky tongue. We've all been fingered. No we've all been fingered by someone with long nails and it does not feel good. Not it's not fun. Not at all. But the but that tongue, that long tongue, you know, Omi's like, well. All right. <laughs> all right. She goes, make me a woman again. Oh God. Give me that cram pussy. Right. That's the last uh, time I'll say it. I promise. <laughs> she they look each other in the eyes. You know, first time she's seen him since she was a child. Uh, he's got this long, like, kind of gray white beard, which I mean, it. He looks cool. I just wish he, we got the mask off. I. That's all I, I wish. Agree. Anyway, he opens up this giant sack of toys and a bunch of like demonic nutcrackers and shit, kind of Jump come out. to the camera, and that's it. We. Oh. That's the end of Omi. Cut back to the family running, and one by one, they're getting picked off by these monsters in the snow, uh, and everything happens really fast. They're carrying like. Adam Scott has a rifle that has a like a, a light, like a flashlight attached to it. And this is, that, for me, cinematography that doesn't work because it keeps shining into the camera and you cannot see what's happening. Yeah. And I understand that perhaps it's intended to make it more suspenseful, but it's just annoying to me, mm. right? Because it's yeah. so many close-ups and so much light shining in my eyes. I just wish that there were maybe more long shots, right? Give me like a downward shot of these snow monsters surrounding them coming yeah. in you know something like that because everyone's dropping like flies and i understand i'm not supposed to have time to take in what's happening it's supposed to you know be surprising it just wasn't effective for me it could have been a little bit yeah. more clear well, and crisp yeah the, because we still don't understand what a, what these snow monsters are these creatures under the snow right we no. don't know i i actually don't think we're really like i think at the end it's all supposed to be just like um christmas and like just effects of stuff right so like they're they're all being eaten they're all being dragged down um they're all dead the elf like one of the elves gets eaten by the thing that was kind of interesting that it didn't is make interesting. much sense like they, to me. they're not even they're not even super safe i don't know if i like that choice or not because we never expound on it exactly adam scott tells everyone to keep going because they're like waist deep in snow and they can't get away and he's got the gun so he tells everybody keep going and he's going to stay behind and shoot these creatures, and then of course he gets eaten. And then uh, Aunt Linda or whatever I keep want to call her Linda Belcher. The aunt gets it's eaten. Either Linda or Sarah, one or yeah, the best two sisters. The... She gets eaten. Then Tony Collette sacrifices herself, puts the kids in in the snowplow. Then she gets eaten. Max is. She tells them "I love you" before she gets yeah. eaten, but I think it's bad editing. I can't explain it. I think it's that shot of her saying "I love you" is like a half a second too long. I agree. Yeah. I know I sound really picky and I'm not a filmmaker, but I am a film enthusiast and I know what works for me. Yeah. And it, it, it doesn't, I want her to like, I think it was, she put, she probably did this take a million times and I don't like the take that they used of her saying, I love you. Yeah. I think I wish it had more urgency. Yeah. I, maybe she's trying to embrace that she knows she's dying and it's supposed to make us sad, but I just wish it happened. It, with everybody dying so fast, I wish she died a little faster. Yeah. And so yeah. now we have Max and we have one of the cousins, cousins in the in the the snowplow with him. They, and then an elf. Co- they get, she gets taken by an elf and then boom. And then Max gets left behind. Krampus leaps leaps down and lands and hands Max his little bobble that says yeah. Krampus. So we now know that Max is going to be left alone as the sole witness and his entire family is gone. Fade to black. And we think that's the end. We think that's the end. And, then, and it, it oh, does it fade to black. It does. And it then, fades to black. And then it fades I, back to Max walking, uh, following the screams. Right? Yeah. And then he now goes I, where they I wish at. it didn't fade to black. It's again editing that is it was weird. weird. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's you're not gonna fool us. We don't think this is the end of the movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, know? it's the it would be the end of the movie with Omi's story. Right. But then we're changing it. Then boom. It's it's just um and it's kind of maybe the end of an act, perhaps, and now we're moving into the you know, if that's the climax, now we're going into the falling action. Yeah. Uh so he follows these screams and comes upon uh, a group of the elves and they're covered in chains and they're being mm-hmm. weird and elfy and scary. Max is approaching the group of elves who are having a little evil party. <laughs> yeah, th- it was like an evil party. Well, they're just like, just like a little r- wrapping evil... up, right? Yeah, I guess. And he screams, hey, give me back my family. And Krampus looks over and is like, who the fuck 
sent you. <laughs> I thought I was done with you. And Max approaches and he takes that bobble and he, he like drops it in the snow, right? Yes. And he's like, I want my family back. I've learned my lesson. You know, you, you proved your point. I want my family. And he drops the bobble in the snow and it starts to melt the snow. And then it, the snow falls into like this giant fiery hell mouth. Yes. <laughs> this but, is where you're like, wait, wait, and, <laughs> wait, wait. And they're bringing up the cousin and they're about to throw her in when he says, take me instead. And yeah. they're every, like, they're all so quiet and they're watching and they're watching and then they start to laugh and they throw the girl into the fucking pit. He screams. And Max is like, ass. no, you guys said take me. And like, you can't bargain with Gravis. Yeah, he grabs you know? Max and by the head. Like the head. Yeah. <laughs> that was so wild. And he just says, I'm sorry. And then fucking throws And then gets hit. Max gets dropped into the hell mouth. It's a little bit of a silly, a silly shot of him falling into the fire in slow motion. Yeah. And his arms and legs are flailing and... I mean, I don't know how else they would have done it. You know, it's just yeah. I mean, it's like almost campy enough, but yeah. like not. I actually kinda... thought it was effective because it goes with the tone of the film. Right. No, it is what it, I mean. It, it's meant. It, it is what it's meant to be. You know. Yeah. One may I make a quick hot take that I realized when I rewatched this, I started getting vibes of this is a very obscure <laughs> hot take. If you ever saw the Sailor Moon TV show. <laughs> The end of the first like season, like all the sailors are going somewhere, and then they slowly get picked off one by one, and then eventually like kind of start sacrificing themselves. And right. it just reminded me of that. Am I the only Sailor Moon fan? Yes. <laughs> I was not a nerd, I, so I, I, yeah, I don't you watch would. Sailor Moon. But maybe <laughs> listeners do, so they they know what you're saying. None of my listeners watched Sailor Moon. I will have you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, if you did, please keep listening to my show. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I was just about Chris, to say, I'm like, Chris uh... is a big fan of Sailor Moon. <laughs> but he knows what you're talking about. Um, all right. So Max awakens in his house on Christmas morning, discovering his family alive and well downstairs. He thinks that what happened was just a nightmare. As he unwraps a present to reveal Krampus's bauble, the family are shown with ominous looks on their faces as their memories of the horrific events slowly come back to them. The camera pans out, revealing that the house is shown through a magical snow globe, along with hundreds of others in a vast collection in the underworld for Krampus to monitor and spy on for having spared them. Hmm. So I was confused. I like until I like read the Wikipedia, like kind of like I was just confused on are they trapped in the snow globe? Are they trapped in this house forever? Or or is it just that he's He's always watching, kind of like Santa's always. So watching. I look at it as like a multiverse kind of thing, right? Every because in their experience of what Krampus did, he didn't only kill their family; he killed the delivery guy, he killed the boyfriend in their family. So the universe that this family lives in, Krampus has taken over their yeah. lived experience and then given them a second chance. There are two fa big fan theories: one that they are trapped in Christmas hell forever. Or two, that they are allowed to continue living lives. They just will always remember, we we don't want to fuck up again. I, like, I feel that they're in Christmas hell because the lighting, that's very soft touch. It reminds me of A Nightmare on Elm Street when um, she, the beginning when she wakes up and she's like, oh my God, we destroyed Freddy. And like, everything is kind of soft touch. There's like Vaseline on the edge of the lens. Everything's a little different. Everything. Very, very Carrie Lake. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me a lot of like the end of Carrie where the, like the main, the, the curly haired girls walking, you know, very slowly, everything's just kind of soft and a little lightly smoky filter, which is, was not how any of this was before. So what, right. then we see that. And I was like, well, Krampus isn't about forgiveness. Krampus isn't about um, hope. Krampus is like, you're done. Like, fuck it. Like, we're done. So to me, I was like, the family didn't make it. And from the moment they that, that blizzard came in, they were screwed. No one else really existed. Like, they were taking out... Yeah. They, they were already dead by, by that time. Yeah. Like, the, the family's already dead. Max would have been the only one to have survived. But then he didn't like he kind of sacrificed himself 
to join his family because he wanted to be with his family. So boom, like the the wish that was granted was not everything's back to normal. It's well, you're going to join your family in hell then. That's how I took it. I do like that for some of the storytelling elements in this movie that don't work for me, this ominous, unclear ending actually really does work for me because Mm -hmm. I, I can see it either way Mm -hmm. and I can see it making perfect sense either way. And I, I, I think it's a really cool way to end the movie and you kind of get to pick whichever ending you know, works for you. I could see them living the rest of their, like being back to normal and these snow globes on Krampus's little scary shelves are, are just him keeping an eye on everybody. Right. But I could also see these snow globes as him having them trapped in. Yeah. Hell. That's his hell. It does also remind me of the end of Jeepers Creepers. Oh yeah. Where you get to see the lair and you kind of pan out and see yeah everything. It's like very much that thing. Yeah, I, I I think that it that is I agree with you, Ricky. That it is cool that there's kind of it does work that there's multiple interpretations of of the ending. Because even I am like, which one do I really believe? I don't even know if I'm locked into one or the other. Yeah, I'm not either. When I first saw the movie, I I it was my interpretation that they were in Christmas Hell, and then the second two times I watched it, I thought, oh, well, maybe not. You know, I I could go either way and maybe it'll be different every time I watch the movie. There are famous horror movie houses in the other snow globes you see. At least that's what IMDb says under trivia. Like the Psycho House is supposed to be one of them. I didn't see any other famous horror houses, but apparently maybe they're in there. I I didn't notice any either. Uh, And... That is the end of Krampus. We get one more little jump scare, which is silly but fun, where all of Krampus's scary evil toy minions leap out at the camera. Yep. Uh, it looks it looks cheesy. It looks very kind of last minute. Why don't we just add some little last minute scare? It's, it's not, it's fine. Yeah, for sure, right? <laughs> so here on the Rick or Treat Horror Cast, we have a rating system. <laughs> the movie is either a trick, which means it was all right, or a treat, which means you loved it, or to smell my feet, which means it sucked. Paul, uh, it's a trick. Yeah, I would say I like I I enjoy it. Will I watch it again? Maybe. Like if someone else wa- watches it, it's not something I'm gonna pick out like like one afternoon to go watch by myself, like or anything. It's, uh, but it's good. I think that there's fun stuff in there, and then it's it's kind of mindless but as you think just a little bit sure yeah yeah um uh for me it's a it's a treat i actually really love this film i think it's really fun i think it is a great film to watch for like christmas time i actually do watch it all the time (laughs) uh, around this time and i will watch it again and I was really happy to introduce Chris to it. And I was really happy that we chose this for this one because it was so cute. Oh, good. Good, good. Yeah, I, I, for me, it's on the high end of trick, low end of treat. It's like a very highly recommended trick. Um, I will watch it again. I tend to watch it, you know, every couple Christmases, yeah. it seems, since it came out. And it, it it's so close to being the movie I wish that it were that I, I do recommend it. It's just me being picky. You know, yeah. uh, what I, what I, it kind of bums me out. The movie did pretty well the year it came out and I feel like it's become forgotten. Mm, yeah. It's, it's not, it didn't get like, it didn't get the status, like the kind of annual classic status that I wish that it had. Uh, I agree. It's no mean girls. It's no, <laughs> have you seen Lindsay Lohan's new Christmas movie falling for Christmas? No, but yes. I worked, <laughs> I worked uh, over this weekend. I was filming this like gay dating show and I was co-hosting it, and my co-host was a guy who was on the Lindsay Lohan reality show, and he oh, like, wow. got into a huge fight with Lindsay Lohan, and he talks about. I her. know exactly. He, Wait, Mike. Mike, yeah, is it? Yeah. Mike MG. I watched that show. Yeah, I, 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 I he, he, he was my co-host, okay. and he told us a lot about Lindsay Lohan and what he went through with her and stuff. Oh, no. It was fun. You know, Lindsay, Lindsay, and I had our mental breakdowns at the same time. 
And I only had to stop mine because I ran out of money and I always, <laughs> right. And she didn't, you know, and I always have this like affinity for her. I, I always have my eye on her making sure she's okay. Like when she lost a finger on a boat, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, and then they sewed it back off. <laughs> like there's, her. Her, her life is insane. <laughs> I, the movie's not very good, but it is enjoyable. Yeah. You know, I'd say like the, it, it loses it loses steam for a good 30 minutes and then it picks steam up again. It's as predictable as any other Hallmark style Christmas movie. 100%. She, she's fine. She, she has like one good tear, like teary scene. And then she also has a really bad scene where she's talking to a horse. So, you know, okay. but I, there is an allusion to mean girls that was really cute that I really very much yeah. enjoyed. Okay. Uh, unexpected. It's worth watching. Right. It, it is. Cool. Move I on. felt like it definitely knew it knew what movie it was. And yeah. I was actually more pleased with her performance than other things that she's done in recent mm-hmm. years. Like it's a little bit better than like the what was that one movie? Uh, I know who killed me. Oh yeah. god. Yes, that. <laughs> it, I mean, the thing is, she she is she can act. She's given some good performances. Yeah. I think that it seems like her life is a little more on track now hopefully and you know i'm an actor who struggled with substances fucking if i'm fucked up all the time i'm not even auditioning for things let alone if i was fucked up on a movie set yeah you know yeah for sure um i i like this resurgence for her and i would love to see more from her coming up there's like she's trying to get a mean girls she's trying to get a freaky friday 2 going jamie lee curtis wants it as well like jamie lee curtis called disney i heard about that like jamie's on board i would watch it but anyway uh enough of this is not the Lindsay lohan podcast although now i kind of want to start one friends why don't you tell me where my listeners can stalk you um you can find us on instagram at scared gay podcast all one word we're on instagram if you want to find me pablo i'm on instagram at the exorcist sf and on tiktok at exorcist 83 Listeners, that's exorcist, like exercise. Yes, like thank you. working out thank because you. he is a personal trainer. Mm-hmm. Paul, where can my listeners stalk you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram and TikTok at Paul You Ever Wanted. So cute. Spelled Y-O-U. <laughs> and I, Ricky, your host, I'm on Instagram at Rick, the letter R, treat. So Rick or treat. And the podcast is at Rick or treat pod. You can also follow me on Letterboxd at uh, Rick or treat with an OR. I know it's confusing. It's all in the descriptions below Perfect. attached to the episode. And uh, that's our show today. Yay. Boys, I cannot thank you enough. You really are like my fairy pod daddy. <laughs> taking, me under, <laughs> taking me under your podcasting wing. And I really appreciate you both. You're wonderful. You're a lot of fun. And I can't wait to collab again in the future. Oh, yeah. You know it's going to happen. Oh, hell yeah. Ricky, we... We love you. This has been a treat for us. <laughs> oh, I love you yeah. guys too. And I hope you have a really wonderful holiday season. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, everything. I'm going to take about a two week break and I'm going to come back to you fresh in January with lots of fun new content. And I cannot wait to show you what I have in store. Oh, yeah. Boys, thank you again very much. And I'll see y'all later, spookies. Bye. Ooh. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for coming Rick or Treating. It'd be a real scream if you'd take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever platform you're listening on. The show's spooky intro and outro music is a cover of Camille Saint-Saëns' Danse Macabre, with kick-ass metal orchestrations composed and performed by Lestat von Monlicht. Links to the artist's music can be found in the episode's description. Check him out, he's frighteningly talented. Rick or Treat Horror Cast is independently produced by me, Ricky J. Duarte of Rick or Treat Productions. If you like what you heard, tell a fiend. I mean, friend. If you didn't, well, they're coming to get you, listener. <laughs>